most of the sound around us in our daily lives is accidental and a lot of it is unpleasant. Just the noise of society, the noise of people doing stuff. In most rooms, it's true to say that if you look around you, everything was designed by somebody. But if you sit and close your eyes, that soundscape, very rarely designed by anybody. And I'm sure all the acousticians in the audience will be nodding internally, if not externally, to that point. So noise is a serious issue in society. The problem is that we've gone unconscious. Because we stand on street corners suppressing that noise and bellowing over the top of it, our natural reaction to sound is to ignore it or to suppress it. And yet noise is extremely devastating. This kind of street noise and aircraft noise in particular have enormous impacts. And I'm talking here at a macro level, so this is chunking up from our conversation about education. The cost of noise in Europe is starting to become clear. You may have seen the recent data from the World Health Organization who estimate that something in the region of 150 million people in Europe are having their sleep disturbed at night because they're living in areas with greater than 55 decibels ambient noise level at night. 150 million people. Sleep deprivation leads to all sorts of knock-on health effects. The, uh, the WHO have also recently estimated that Europe is losing one million years of healthy life every year because of this. And in fact, they've gone on record as saying that noise pollution is now a more serious issue for Europe than air pollution. So at last, possibly, sound is getting the attention it deserves. It has a major impact on people. The cost of this kind of thing to Europe is absolutely astronomical. This dates back to the late 90s when the EU attempted to estimate the cost of noise to society up to 2% of GDP across Europe. That's a huge number, billions and billions of euros at a time when we can scarcely afford that kind of wastage. Sound affects you in four ways. And that's a little shot of cortisol, your fight-flight hormone. I hope your alarm clock at home doesn't sound anything like that because it's not very good for you to be shocked into a waking uh, state like that. Sudden noises give us cortisol releases all the time in urban environments. But it's not just uh, your hormones which are affected by sound. It's also your breathing, your heart rate, and even your brain waves. So if I were to put a sound like this on and leave it for a few minutes, your heart rate would start to reduce. Surf has a cadence of roughly 12 cycles per minute. It's very similar to the breathing of a sleeping human being. It's also a sound that we associate with being relaxed on holiday, having not a care in the world. So it's a, a sound that will tend to reduce heart rate. The second way sound affects us, there are four ways. The second way sound affects us is psychological. So this piece of music isn't going to make you feel happy. It wasn't designed to make you feel happy. Music is an extremely good conveyor of emotion. We all know that. We're all used to using it either to elevate emotions or to uh, suppress emotions. We feel better when we're sad. Not the only sound that does that though. Birdsong, for example, which we use at the sound agency a great deal. We put it in BP service station toilets, for example. Birdsong makes many people feel secure because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, things are okay. It's only when they suddenly stop that there's a little frisson because it may be there's a predator or something bad is about to happen. Third way sound affects us is cognitive. You cannot you understand two version, people talking at the same track. time, or in this Try case, one person talking one. twice. Even a woman cannot understand two people talking at the same time. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, but that is the truth. Roughly 1.6 is our bandwidth for human conversation. So that means if you have to work in an office that sounds like this, or indeed in a school that sounds anything like this, it has a devastating effect on productivity. In fact, the rush to open plan, and this obviously is a result from offices which applies to any open plan situation, and there are even open plan schools being developed now, uh, much to my personal horror. Open plan can degrade your productivity massively. If you're trying to do mental work which involves listening to your internal voice, if there are people around you talking, obviously that takes up that bandwidth and reduces your productivity significantly. So, noise is um, a very major effect on cognition. And the fourth and final way in which sound affects us is behaviourally. At the simplest level, if I put on an unpleasant sound like this, 
And if I left that on for all oh, five minutes, you would start thinking about leaving. That's what we do if we're surrounded by unpleasant sound. We just remove ourselves from the situation. We just exit. That's the simplest way in which we, we behaviorally respond to sound. But there are other ways as well. Noise has been shown to make us less sociable, more aggressive, less helpful, all sorts of social impacts of noise around us. Let me just uh, set a frame for today by suggesting a, a simple model for communication. At one end of communication, we have sending. Now, this is where we focus all our attention in education, on the sending. We agonize about the curriculum. We train teachers so that they send as well as possible. But of course, sending isn't the only part of communication. At the other end of sending, there's a receiver. And whether, even if we send brilliant stuff and we send it brilliantly, whether that gets received or not is down to whether the receiver is up for it. Do they have a good attitude? It's not always the case in schools, I'm sorry, but if, uh, if you didn't know that, I think we all do know that. It's not always the case in schools. And do they have the ability to receive it? Can they hear? And do they have the skill to receive everything that's being sent? And that's about listening, not just hearing. But there's a third factor. It's not just sending and receiving. Those happen in a context. And that context is a space. And the space has a huge effect on the effectiveness of that send-receive line of communication. Let's just consider the receive in, a, in a, a little bit more detail. I mentioned attitude. Now, we have to leave that down to the teachers. There are brilliant teachers out there working with children of all kinds. It's also down to parents. And those two really influence, I'm sure, the attitude of most pupils when they come into school. Are they up for it or not? So it's outside of the scope of our conversation today. Ability and skill, those are things which we need to cover today. And if we just think about ability, the hearing ability, it's very easy for people to think that you have two types of individuals out there. You have people with perfect hearing, and you have people who have hearing impairment. Now, the estimates are that roughly 2% of the school population has severe hearing impairment. And it's easy to think the other 98% have no problems. But actually, of course, this is not the case. The case is that there's a continuum, and the continuum runs from people with perfect hearing through all sorts of conditions, many of them temporary, as simple as a cold, or hay fever, or glue ear, or an ear infection, all sorts of conditions which come and go. So on any given day, the best guesses I've seen are that roughly 16 to 18% of the school population is suffering from some sort of hearing impairment, anywhere on that spectrum. That's a lot of people who aren't necessarily able to hear properly, even in a good room. And then there's listening. We spend up to 60% of our time in communication listening, but we retain just one word in four on average of what we hear. So we're not great listeners. Now, obviously, not you, not this seminar. You're going to retain everything that you hear today, but that is the average for most people. Listening is making meaning from sound. That's how I would define it, and it's a skill. And indeed, I would say, unfortunately, listening is something of a dying skill. We don't teach it in any schools that I know of in any serious way. Listening is an, a really complex skill. There are many ways to listen, and we need to get that across. I have a whole TED talk on that subject, which we don't have time to go into today. So that's dealt with, can the receiver here? Are they up for it? And are they listening? Let's have a look at the groups for whom listening may be a serious challenge. First of all, we have those with hearing impairment. I mean, if you can't hear it, it's very hard to listen. Secondly, there are 10% or more of the school population for whom English is a second language. Now, if we all imagine ourselves sitting in a French school and trying to keep up with what's going on, you'd have to be extremely fluent not to be challenged at some points. That's a big part of the population. And there's a third group I would suggest, and we're going to see uh, some discussion about this shortly, which is just introverts, people who are quiet by nature. They're challenged by loud environments. Now, you add that lot together, and that is a very, very large proportion of school students who are challenged in their listening. 
The space has a kind of symbiotic relationship with the noise in it. There's a dynamic process here, a cycle. So you all know, if you go into a restaurant and you're the first person in there, it's lovely and quiet. As the crowd builds, the noise level goes up and there's a tipping point. There's a point at which it escalates out of control and then everybody's shouting from one foot away to get themselves heard. That's called the Lombard effect. It's a well-known acoustic phenomenon. It's a cycle and it works the other way around as well. If you damp a space down, then people tend to get quieter. We're going to call that the library effect today. So architects uh, tend to like things that look awfully clean. And if there were people in this classroom, can you imagine what it would sound like? So I've suggested that the topic they could be considering for, the debt for today is do architects have ears at all? I believe that in five years of training, they spend one day on sound. And we have an architect here who's going to speak in the second half about why they've become so ocular and the scope for a broader understanding of architecture. This kind of classroom is a disaster. Looks great, sounds terrible. And I wouldn't like to try and be educated in this space. As a result of spaces like that, noise levels in classrooms are extremely high. There's a huge study that's being done in 2005 across Germany uh, in hundreds of schools, and they found the average sound pressure level, the average noise level in a classroom is 65 decibels. Now, to give, I mean, the acousticians in the audience know exactly what 65 decibels sound like, but for the rest of us, to give you an idea, normal conversation would be somewhere between 40 and 60 decibels. So 60, you'd be struggling to be heard. It, it would be quite a challenge, like a cocktail party, but not, you know, not shouting. 40 would be a whisper, a very quiet conversation. And if I stopped talking, that's probably about 30, 35 decibels, I would guess, in this room as an ambient noise level. So that gets very quiet. 65 is loud. 65 is shouting to be heard over the top of it. And that's the average in that study. So classrooms are noisy places. Also, there's studies being done. This is from America, but it could apply anywhere. Now, I know Florida, of course, they've got air conditioning booming away in every classroom because it's hotter there. But we have kit in classrooms too. We have fans and computers. We have whiteboards. We have other pieces of equipment going off, as well as heating systems and many air conditioning systems. What this study found is that from row three back, speech intelligibility was 0.5 or worse. That is to say, the students were receiving only one word in two, roughly. Now, it doesn't mean they're losing half their education at source, because, of course, we interpolate. So if, even if you're only hearing one word in two, you can kind of keep up. It does mean that if you rip away those words, you have to work awfully hard to get the same education. Really hard. Fatigue, stress, effort. And if you're not engaged, would you make that effort? So sitting back here in row five, not a good situation. And have you noticed how there's a kind of dynamic here too? The kids who don't want to pay attention sit at the back, so they'll be talking as well. So these all have dynamic loops in them, these effects. I think a good analogy for this is watering a garden. What's happening effectively is that a lot of the water is evaporating before it ever gets to the flowers. That is our education system at the moment. Now, nobody knows quite how bad this is, and, and one big part of today is to plea for more research to be done, but we do have some figures which shine a, a very bright light on certainly what's happened in Essex, and I think we can extrapolate from those. Here's another study to give you a better impression uh, of a very big study in Sweden. This was university students, not schools, and a very large study, 42% of the students said they often or regularly had problems hearing. And of that 42%, the effects, 78% had trouble concentrating, half became tired, 40% had trouble remembering what they'd heard. So there you see the effects feeding through. I was privileged with several of the other speakers you're here today to be at the launch of the Essex study. And we will be talking about that quite a bit today because it's the first significant study that's given us an insight into what's happening in Britain's schools. 
the Essex study gives us a really, really profound insight. And just to give you an idea of what it found, this is a direct quote from the report. The correlation is between reverberation time and the quality of the teaching environment as perceived by those in it. So reverberation time is pretty much the key to this whole thing. 